Yes, Father, we just thank you so much for Garth and his heart to hear from you and his willingness to speak the truth. And I just pray that this morning as he brings this word, Father, that you would give him the truth and love and that his heart would be compelled by yours, Lord, and that it wouldn't be from his own, um, his own heart, Father, but that it would be connected to yours and hear, he would hear from you as he speaks, Father. And I just pray for an openness in this room this morning, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us where we are at. Lord, you know all of our hearts. And Father, I pray that you would just open each one and pierce it with your word this morning. We thank you for, for what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. So I'm going to be uh, preaching from the Word, and uh, I'm so incredibly thankful that this is a, a church that loves to focus on the Word of God, which can transform our lives if we allow God to do it. I needed to preach from Luke, and I had a big choice of a lot of topics, but I chose one which turned out to be one that uh, is basically been breaking me all week. And that's a good thing, you know. <laughs> I like brokenness. I like being convicted of my sin. I like repenting. I like times of refreshing. I really need it. I don't know about you, but I need breaking. And this one is from Luke 22, 39 44. And I call it, Yet not my will, but yours be done. Okay, so. This is... Uh, a passage that comes on late Thursday evening before Jesus is going to go to the cross and the disciples have they done a lot with Jesus in these last hours they shared the Last Supper uh, Jesus gave his upper room discourse his longest talk continuously in the New Testament uh, in the Gospels it, you can find the whole text as far as it's been recorded by John in chapters 13 through 17. He's instituted communion. He's dealt with followers who say that they want to be with him and don't understand the cost of what it means to, to go to the cross, to die. Uh, Judas has gone to prepare betrayal, and the next day, Jesus will die. But before this ordeal, Jesus went to a place to pray. Now here's a map of Jerusalem. You can see where the temple is. You can see the Mount of Olives. And at the base of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know it as well as some of you in the audience here who've been to that place. Um, but I look forward to going there, my wife and I and the boys. Uh, Gethsemane literally refers to an oil press. And there's a picture of what it looked like, and you can see up there, I shouldn't have put the letters in blue, but that's in, in Greek and Hebrew. And it basically is an oil press, a place for pressing oil. You know, I love black olives the most. How many of you like black olives, as compared to green ones? Okay? Well, I hate to disappoint you, but the best pure virgin olive oil comes from green olives. Yeah. Uh, okay, so all the green olive lovers are rejoicing in that. It's interesting that um, just before going to the cross, Christ would choose to go to a place where they crush something so that it, after being crushed, can become of much greater value. Reminds me of the Savior. This is what the Garden of, that's a photo of the actual Garden of Gethsemane, as far as we know the location where this took place. This is the Garden at night. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. Now it says Jesus went out as usual, so we know this is a place that he goes to regularly. By the way, the Garden of Gethsemane wasn't like some public park. It's privately owned. We don't know who the owner is. There's a number of instances in the Bible where there are people that are never named, but God knows who they are, who did wonderful things for our Lord and Savior during his ministry. And one of them is 
providing a regular place for prayer. I don't know about you, but I have a regular place, place for prayer, and I find that if I don't have some regular place to go where there's peace and quiet, where there's not a lot of distractions, I don't pray. I don't, I don't know about you. Do, how many of you could raise your hand and say, I have a regular place to pray where I can really commune with the Lord without a lot of distractions? I suggest that you find such a place. Because I believe for most people, if you don't have such a place, you don't pray regularly. And we need that. Maybe it'll be a humble closet. Maybe it'll be a garden. Maybe you'll have to bundle up, put on your thermals and everything and go find a park. There's plenty of them here. But we need a regular place to pray. And it was also, this garden was a place where Judas knew that Jesus would go with his disciples and that he could go there later in the night and betray him. Imagine being betrayed by one of your closest followers, because they were 12, that's pretty close, and being betrayed at one of your favorite places to go and pray and worship the Lord. So on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He knelt down and he prayed. Um, we know that uh, we know that Jesus got there and he left uh, most of the disciples. He chose three to come with him a little bit further, left them to wait and pray, and then he went in further uh, to pray. And I think it's great that just before the greatest thing in the history of man to ever happen, Jesus' priority was to pray. He wasn't going to proceed with this historic event without first going to his Father. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. And you don't want to proceed until you hear it from him. Usually he won't give you the whole plan. I don't know about you, but I was never given the 10-year plan. I imagined it. I created it. I thought I had it set in stone. How many times did that work out? <laughs> it never did. Yeah. But one thing's for sure. He will be happy to give you the next step. Even if it's day by day. But, of course, you'd always have to take time and stop and listen to hear him give you the next step. Matthew and Mark's accounts give the greatest detail about this whole thing with the garden. Uh, they talk about Peter, James, and John being the ones who were chosen to go and to stay and pray. Uh, in those accounts, we find out that Jesus went alone to pray and went back there sleeping. Went away again, prayed the same, went back there sleeping. Went away again, went back, and they're sleeping a third time. But you know what? A lot of times, I've heard messages that get down on those guys who are sleeping. Do you know, they had just been told by Jesus, I'm going to die. I'm going to leave you alone. I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you. And after three years of intimate fellowship with Jesus, they're told, I'm going to, to their hearts, abandon you physically. I'm going to leave you a spirit. What is that? How can your spirit replace you Jesus Christ, we have been with you intimately with this fellowship, and you're just going to leave us? They were exhausted. It was late. They were stressed out. They fell asleep. Anybody here ever be exhausted, stressed out, and fall asleep? So let's not be too hard on those guys. I understand what was happening. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. 
And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. A lot of times you hear a sermon on this, and they talk about the drops of blood. They point out, and doctors raise their hand, yes, it's true. You can reach a point of so much exhaustion, so much stress, that you can literally sweat. Mingled with your liquid sweat, you can sweat drops of blood. So, it's medically, physically possible. And they put a big focus there. What about us? What about us focusing on doing the will of God and praying in such earnestness that we just sweat? We don't even have to sweat drops of blood. Wouldn't it be amazing if we fell down before the Lord and prayed with such huge energy and passion and zeal that we looked down and we were soaked with sweat. You know, we idolize sports superstars. We idolize whoever's number one in the world. Almost everybody in this room has a favorite sport, and you know who's number one in that sport. You know who the, the Michael Jordan or the Tiger Woods or whatever of that sport is. And you think they're amazing. They're superhuman. Let me tell you why they're superhuman. Every day, they'll get up early in the morning before anyone else will, maybe even fellow competitors. And they will do whatever amount of work and discipline that they must do with the right coach to the point where they collapse and sometimes just fall to the ground in exhaustion from practicing, practicing, practicing what it takes to become number one. That's the price that they're willing to pay. They know the champions are made way outside of their comfort zone. Amen. They know that that's where the good stuff happens. That's true. And that's where it happens in our walk with Jesus. I'm sorry. I love to challenge. I hope you don't mind. I get inspired. I listen to those YouTube videos. Listen to this, and you'll do harder fitness than you ever did this morning, you know? Watch this, and you'll love to read the great books of the world. You know, hear this TED Talk, and you will, you know, I love that stuff. You can probably tell by listening to me. But every athlete knows that there is no greatness without paying the price. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there is a price to pay to experience God's best. I think I'm kind of kidding myself on the days when I get up and I leave my bedroom without a prayer, without going to the special place, without getting in the Word, without worshiping the Lord. I go to the kitchen, there's my wife, three little boys. I say, God bless you. You're wonderful. Have a great day. Please bless my day. Bye. Gotta go. And then I walk out the door and I think that I know God's plan for my life for that day. I know what He wants me to do, who He wants me to say, and I have the power from the Holy Spirit to say it and do it. I don't think so. Do you have any great relationship in your life which costs nothing, which requires a few words of communication, and yet it's great, you have trust, you can depend on each other, it's wonderful, you know what their thoughts are, they know what yours are, you care about them, you forgive them, you love them, you're patient with them, you're kind with them, and you don't even give them the time of day, you don't even listen to them or share. I don't understand. How do we believe that it's possible in our physical relationships here on earth? That we could get all that? Well, we must, if that's what we give to God. I do it. So I'm not here saying, you, you, you. I'm saying, me, me, me. Happens to me. When I tell my boys to do something, and they show total disrespect, I say, clean your room. I walk away. 
A minute later, I come back. They're just playing. I tell them again, clean your room. I walk away. I come back. They're playing again. I'm like, did I even speak? What's going on here? Did, have they lost the ability to hear? Do they have any respect for me at all? And so finally, I'll go in and I'll say, you have 10 seconds to clean your room, to start cleaning your room, or you will not go to the park this afternoon. You will not get Kinder Chocolate. You will not get to be in on story time tonight. And you know what they do? They go immediately. They take action. For little boys, that's a big price to pay. I haven't found that God's a negotiating parent. I haven't found that at all. In temptation to sin or the sin itself, he commands me, stop. Run away. Come on. Yeah. Seek my face. That's right. Read my word. What are you doing, Garth? We've been together all these years and that's still happening. Stop. And when I don't obey, you know what? He doesn't take away the goodies. He doesn't take away salvation. That's just based on faith, on what Christ did on the cross. He doesn't look at me and go, well, you weren't obedient, so I'm going to curse you. I'm going to take it all away. He doesn't do that at all. I didn't pay any price for the cross. Jesus paid it all. And there's nothing I can do to earn it or deserve it. That's right. Preach it, brother. But I must not imagine that when we willfully disobey, disrespect, that God looks at the cross and says, No problem. I see you through the cross. All is forgiven. My son's torture, his death, his persecution, his rejection, everything. No problem. Sin away, Garth. It's just fine. Let me lavish my blessings on you anyway. There's a destructive teaching that says, go ahead, sin, you're covered by the blood. No need to feel conviction of sin. No need to repent. Rivers of blessings. It's not in my Bible. Not mine either. Disobedience and willful sin will not bring a great blessing from God. We must not twist the Word of God to fit our lifestyle. If you want to hear from the Lord, take time for Him so He can speak to you. If you want rich blessings from the Lord, Walk in obedience. Jesus didn't cry out, Not your will, but mine. Be done. In fact, Jesus in his ministry said, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. He's asking us to die. He's saying, I'm the number one thing, not you. That's a hard word. And then he set the example with his own life and death. Jesus said, humbly, not my will, but yours be done. How much anguish was he experiencing at this point that an angel would come to minister to him? Well, the movies would tell you that guardian angels are all around. They're always protecting you from car accidents, from this mishap, from that. Those angels are just everywhere. Everything's cool because you got angels. Let's look at the Bible and see when the angels come. Angels come when a lost person enters the kingdom. And what are they doing? They're praying. Angels appear when God's followers are in impossible situations. And what are they doing? They're praying. Daniel prayed in the lion's den and an angel came. Peter prayed in prison and an angel came. 
Paul prayed in a storm and an angel came. Jesus prayed in a garden hours before being nailed to a cross and an angel came. Jesus asked God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. What was the cup? Well, yes, it was the cup of suffering, the cup of the cross. Jesus was quite familiar with suffering. Isaiah prophesies that Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. What kind of things did he grieve over? What caused him sorrow? He was grieved over his people's hardness of heart. He was filled with sorrow over a friend who died. He grieved over the superficiality of Jewish leaders. When he arrived in Jerusalem for the last time, he saw the city and he wept. Hebrews 5, 7 and 8. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because why? Reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. I wish I could pray like that. I have so much love and compassion that I would just cry out and be overcome with grief over people falling into a Christless eternity. People I know and love, my own family members. Why can't I cry out with those fervent prayers? What's holding me back? No love, no compassion? Oh God, release me to pray powerful prayers that change the course of people's eternity. Yes, Lord. Preach it. And what was the cup that was going to be taken from him that he wanted? Was it what was coming next? You know, after the prayers in the garden, he's betrayed by one of his followers, life and death trials, Peter's denials, convicted when innocent, publicly experienced extreme torture, ridicule. By nine in the morning, he's nailed to the cross. By three that afternoon, the ultimate Passover lamb would be dead. Were these the horrible experiences that he was begging, take this cup from me? Let's just focus on this one verse. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Was he so stressed out that he would change prophecy that went all through the Bible of God's plan of redemption? Would he pray such a thing to avoid pain and suffering? I don't believe it. That's not the Jesus that I know and follow. The worst cup that he faced was taking upon himself the man of holiness, never sin, holy, 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 and he would take the vile, disgusting sin of mankind on himself. All his life, he watched sin destroy people, their health, their relationships. It brought death, hatred, burning power, passion from horrible leaders. He saw sin just wreck this world that God created and these people who he loved. It opened the door to Satan. It caused mankind to reject their Savior. Imagine God saying to them, I'm going to put all their sin on you. This is what he said. The words are not in the Bible. I'm imagining God saying this to his son. I'm going to put all their sin on you, and you'll have no fellowship with me when that happens. Why? Because, as God says in his word, I can't stand sin in my presence. Jesus Christ cut off from the greatest love relationship in the history of the world. And why? For his love his love, his love for you and me. Amen. Amen. What is the crucial decision necessary to follow close to God? 
not my will, but thine be done. Every major decision you have to make, lay it on the altar. Seek his face, his will, and then walk in it. And when you do that, you can confidently make decisions. Amen. Because you know that it's the will of God. You can tell how much God trusts you. It's interesting. Look at how big the challenges are. The size of the trials that he puts in your life. He wouldn't allow it if he didn't know that by his power you are going to make it through. Have you been challenged by any great trials lately? Maybe we should be worried if we don't have any. Walk in the will of God and you invite his power to see you through to victory. Amen. You may right now be out of the will of God and you know it. You're thinking of how far off you are from the passion you once had to follow after Jesus. And you know it. You know how much time you have wasted. Listen to me. Nothing is wasted in the Christian life. That God will not redeem it and use it for His glory and the fulfillment of His plan greater than you ever imagined in your life. Nothing is wasted. No matter how far off you travel, He will guide you back. Right now He wants to cleanse you, He wants to heal you, He wants to speak to you, He wants to guide you. The God of the universe wants to do all of that for you. Have you contemplated the price that God paid for your sin? Have you considered the depth of God's love that he would let his son go through his humiliation, his torture, and his death. For you, are you willing to run away from ungodliness and into a life of holiness? Do you want to be set apart for your king? Will you put God first and on the throne of your life as king? Will you pray the prayer of Jesus? Not my will, but thine be done. Will you?